Good afternoon. It is my great pleasure to greet you all and uh, to welcome you all on uh, the third uh, webinar, ENS webinar, <clears throat> ENS section for peripheral nerve surgery uh, related uh, to the international to the international appraisal and uh, international cases in peripheral nerve surgery. I am very pleased to tell you that um, in previous two webinars, we achieve a significant number of participants. Uh, it is the same today. Uh, more than 500 participants are already registered to this uh, webinar, uh, which gives us a real pleasure, gives us uh, who are dealing with peripheral nerve surgery pathology uh, support and uh, feeling that uh, we are doing the right thing and uh, to continue to do this. I'm uh, especially thankful to ENS uh, for uh, unconditional support. And of course, I would like to welcome all panelists um, and to congratulate Katri Krishnan for uh, the organization of uh, this webinar. Uh, I would leave the floor now to Katrik uh, to start with uh, the <clears throat> webinar. Uh, we have a joint venture with WFNS uh, Committee for Peripheral Nerve Surgery since we are all members of uh, WFNS Committee and this is a unique opportunity to have um, this uh, kind of um, seeing each other since we are not uh, gathering in our uh, meetings like we used to do it. Hi Mariano, good to see you. Hello, 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 I'm sorry. I thought it was one, one, oh, one hour late. It's okay, so we officially started. Enjoy the webinar and uh, Karthik, please. Um, I hope everybody can hear me. Uh, thank you very much uh, for, uh, first of all, to the panelists for accepting to present your cases. Uh, I am actually today in the background. I'm not gonna present any cases. I'm gonna support Dr. Konechny. Now Konechny is uh, from St. Petersburg and he will deliver a speech in Russian and I will be translating that speech into the English language. So I would give a very short introduction. And uh, one more request is um, the speakers um, will introduce the next speaker after they have finished speaking. And uh, they will also moderate the discussion of the next speaker. So that please uh, the panelists look into the program and uh, be ready to moderate the next speaker, please. Uh, now I'll start my screen sharing. Um, no, 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 that's, uh, unfortunately we lost a very dear friend and a father figure to me um, and my mentor a couple of days ago. So I just want to observe silence for 10 seconds. Thank you very much. So I'll be speaking about internationalism in uh, peripheral nerve surgery. I come from the Frankfurt Maintanus Clinics in Frankfurt, Germany, and I'm affiliated to the Liebig University in Gießen. Uh, peripheral nerve lesion is um, a multidisciplinary challenge. It is seen by different specialties quite differently. The neurologist, the, the physical therapist, the surgical specialists like orthopedic surgeons, plastic surgeons, and neurosurgeons, uh, and also recently the mechatronic engineers and inventors, they have a very big role to play in peripheral nerve lesions. Yep. And of course, for the management, it is a completely different issue, as we all know. Uh, geographical specificities of peripheral nerve surgery, um, you know, in many countries, it is the domain of the orthopedics and plastic surgeons, whereas in most of mainland Europe and the Americas, neurosurgeons tend to do this. So they, are, they're, they, they view things differently from different angles. The true meaning of internationalism is interdisciplinarity and taking into account the geographical specificities, not only uh, from uh, the viewpoint of the surgeon, but also uh, the nosological entities that are being treated, for example, uh, for, for some 
time in, in, in Great Britain, it used to be uh, stab injuries. And in the, and in the United States, uh, it used to be gunshot injuries. Uh, this might have shifted a little bit. We learn, especially the young uh, neurosurgeons and young peripheral nerve surgeons learns much more by examining the patient himself, meticulous uh, neurological exam and meticulous note-taking, rich note-taking uh, is very important uh, for peripheral nerves. And uh, of course, we learn much more if we follow up our patients ourselves and infer to what we have done and what we can do better. So heterogeneous, the lesions are quite heterogeneous. We No two lesions are alike. No two lesions are alike in peripheral nerve. We all know that. And the tumors, albeit uh, carrying the same name, uh, might, pro, might, might tend to behave differently, like a cellular schwannoma tends to recur more often than um, uh, <clears throat> a conventional schwannoma or, or um, malignant peripheral nerve sheath tumors, uh, metastasized per continuum, and so on. So studying individual cases in peripheral nerve lesions has, in my opinion, more value than uh, cohort studies, which may not necessarily reflect the real world situation. And sometimes we also deal with the Heisenberg effect. That means uh, uh, surgery itself might change the, the, the site, the, OP, OP, or the, the surgical site, uh, like in the Heisenberg effect in physics. So true internationalism is equal to tolerance towards diversity in thinking. Diversity is the solution. And uh, our openness and ability to look at things differently from different perspectives. And we have to accumulate experience by applying well thought over strategies for individual cases, um, rather than just applying uh, cohort principles. And of course, the young peripheral nerve surgeon, surgeon requires exposure, exposure and exposure to different situations, different uh, thinking, different schools of thought, and thus he gains experience. I, I will finish my talk with this. And um, if you have any discussion points, you can go ahead and do it now. Uh, otherwise, uh, uh, well, we can, is there any discussion to this or shall we go ahead with the next topic? All right, uh, then I would like to introduce Lin Jacques, uh, a colleague of mine from University of San Francisco. Uh, she's uh, the professor of neurosurgery at the Purple Nerve Program in, uh, and the vice chairman of, uh, of uh, neurosurgery in the department there. Lin, I give you the word. Thank you so much. Uh, can you hear me? Just I'd like to check that to start with. Yes, we can hear you. All right, thank you very much uh, for this invitation. I have nothing to disclose for this talk except to thank Cardic for uh, all the great work that is doing for not only the European Association, but uh, in peripheral nerve in general. So these two unusual cases, I'd like to present them because I've learned a lot from them and I think you may enjoy them. The first patient is a 66 year old female with a past medical history positive for diabetes um, chronic uh, kidney disease, cirrhosis due to EPSI. She presented to an outside hospital with necrotic gangrenous left forearm after a fall. As a matter of fact, all she has is a scratch or neurological exam were completely normal and all the blood tests was negative. She was then, because of this necrotic gangrenous situation, uh, uh, was amputated above the elbow and the mid humerus uh, area. She was then uh, requested to be transferred at UCSF under um, orthopedic surgery uh, team. And then what happened is that she uh, had right away a CT with contrast showing it, the view of a distal humerus at the level of the amputation, demonstrating basically the thicken of the radial nerve at that level, at the distal level. If you can appreciate that as well from the sagittal and coronal view, you can see that there's a thicken of the uh, posterior cord as well. The MRI neurogram uh, shows, like you know, at the D, E, and F panels, uh, an enhancement not only on the posterior cord, but the thicken of the lateral and medial cord as well. 
So um, she was then, it was then decided because of the negative uh, culture, she was seen by infectious disease team. She was uh, also seen by orthoplastic and ourselves um, to proceed with the uh, 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 more proximal amputation. And that from the uh, only uh, pathological section that was positive uh, from the nerve standpoint, the h &E shows an infiltration of the perineurium, as you can see here, and at the IS magnification, you can see the infiltration of the mucoralis organism infiltrating the perineurium of uh, that nerve. As you all know, most common of this uh, disease is that in developing countries, the incidence is 8.3 to 13 percent of all fungal infections, and uh, you can, uh, you know that um, Usually the route, the route of exposure or pulmonary and sinus form, the cutaneous is fungus entering into the skin, like this case through cuts, and there's different form of that uh, mucormycosis. Now you're seeing here the perineural space and uh, the way that it can spread. Usually it's referred uh, as for the cancer, it's not infectious, and it's a conduit for tumor to spread uh, from its source. There's two types of tumor growth, perineural invasion and perineural uh, spread. And as you all know, the perineural spread is associated with the decreased overall survival. There's also two main presentation for the perineural spread. As you can see on that slide here, this is like from Spinner work. And uh, that work uh, shows that there's a primary uh, type of perineural spread that is a pathology that is such breast cancer will be through the neural pathways of the brachial plexus. This is one of my case here where uh, it was the case, it was a perineural primary spread. And you have also the secondary spread that can be like, uh, for instance, to a pancose tumor. So the, the symptoms of these patients will depend on the site of infiltration. The treatment is usually antifungal medication and you have to follow the precaution uh, for, from the CDC. Despite the surgery, uh, the patient unfortunately passed away after infiltration of the lung, it's spread to the lung. And uh, um, the, as you know, the uh, spread can be through uh, direct tissue invasion or imitogenously uh, after angio uh, invasion. Uh, we have, uh, for the first time, docu documented a case of perineal spread. And here's the paper and the references for those who are uh, interested in uh, going a little bit more in depth. And we're going to have a discussion a little bit later on. My second case is a 25-year-old female with 1.5-year history of left intermedial uh, thigh pain with no previous episode, no back pain, no constitutional symptoms, not known for any disease in the past. She has a twin sister that is completely healthy and she has a young son. She was recently uh, seen for an increased severity and sensory deficit and a mass. And um, uh, there's two weakness mainly of the hip flexion and hip extension. The rest of her physical examination was completely unremarkable. If we look at the sensation, it was decreased in the anterolateral tie. The reflexes were normal, the toes were down going, and she was walking normally. Her EMG was uh, unremarkable as well. As you can see on these uh, slides, uh, there were some cathiole spot, inguinal freckling, and um, that was uh, uh, seen on this uh, leg. Uh, the MRI here uh, done at the site of uh, the mass was reflecting um, a tumor that was uh, that you can see on T2 fat suppression, both in axial and coronal view. The uh, PET scan that was done revealed a uh, very high SUV and the metastatic uh, workup was completely negative. The patient was brought to the operating room uh, knowing that it's a triton tumor. Uh, there were a resection of that mass en bloc and uh, there were some uh, nerve repair after intraoperative uh, radiation therapy, as you can see here. From the h &E perspective, it was a highly cellular spindle cell uh, proliferation and with uh, increased pleoformism in, uh, to the tumor cells. Uh, it was positive for S100, SOX10, and myogenin. And the cytogenetic uh, analysis uh, was positive for alteration, including nonsense mutation in NF1 frame shift mutation in TP53 and all the deep deletion that you can see on this slide. 
So uh, unfortunately, uh, rab, uh, the Triton tumor has very poor prognosis. Rhabdomyoblastic differentiation characterizes this type of tumor. They tend to recur very quickly. Uh, it's less than 10% of all MPNST, less than 1% of all sarcoma. They're mostly aggressive and the survival rate is about 10% at five year. A segmental NF represent 10% on NF1. It is uh, the first case that we know describing uh, not only a triton tumor, but in a segmental uh, NF patients uh, that was not known before. Um, so uh, given the very aggressive nature of this tumor, we uh, did recommend an early rec uh, uh, workup uh, because we know that there's early recurrence and uh, metastasis is really uh, frequent. So early clinical and radiological uh, follow-up is really crucial for these cases. And here for those uh, who wants to uh, know a little bit more about that case. And I hope I didn't uh, took too much time. I'm gonna stop sharing. Thank you very much, Dean, for this fantastic talk. Um, I can. I would like to begin the discussion with the second case which you presented. Um, first, did you did you reset the nerve uh, completely on block with the, the tumor, or was was the nerve preserved? I, I didn't quite understand that. That is number one. And number two. Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay. Sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, so um, the tumor was partially into the nerve. So the femoral nerve was uh, more medial than where the tumor was. So there was a sparing of the nerve and we had negative margin despite that. Okay, and uh, the intraoperative radiation, um, how often do we do it and whom do you collaborate with? It's uh, our team of radio oncologists. Uh, it's Dr. Steve Bronsman. And it's it, Bronstein, I'm sorry, and he is uh, part of the radiation uh, therapy uh, group. So this patient was uh, evaluated uh, by the tumor board, sarcoma tumor board, and the radio oncologist is the one who come in the operating room and discuss with uh, the team and uh, proceed with this uh, intraoperative radiation therapy. Is there any question from the audience further? What about the surgery or the first case? I'm sorry, can you repeat the question? Or on the first case, what kind of surgery you performed? Oh, it was an amputation. So I did resect the nerve. So that's more of histological interest, I suppose. That's, that's correct. So, like it's, I think Rob Spinner has a lot of interest and has published a lot into um, how those uh, tumors can spread with primary and secondary infiltration. Uh, uh, through the perineural spread uh, type of uh, situation. And I think um, this modality is uh, really uh, often uh, not uh, looked at. And I think it carry a much more um, a poor prognosis. And this patient died eight days after her admission. Um, so I think uh, if you do have that, and if it's the case, then uh, most likely those patients will do poorly. Same situation with uh, the tumor, especially for breast cancer. Okay, thank you very much. Are there any other questions? Julene? If not, Lene, could you please introduce the next speaker? Yes, so I'm very pleased to introduce Dr. Tat, uh, who uh, will talk to us about uh, does carpal tunnel release need simultaneous opinoplasty in case wasted tenure eminence? Thank you, Dr. Lene. It's indeed a pleasure and a privilege to take part in this symposium and meet old friends like Lucas and Karthik and Mariano and make some new ones. I have a short presentation. Does carpal tunnel release have to have a simultaneous opponent's plasty? I bring greetings from Bombay Hospital in Mumbai. I am here in India and this symposium is through Germany and Brussels and so on. This is our standard protocol of carpal tunnel release. We do what is called minimal access open release. We take an incision in the radial aspect of the fourth ray, a small incision, expose the roof of the carpal tunnel, incise it, and then after putting a retractor in the proximal forearm, we open the carpal tunnel, including the deep fascia of the proximal
proximal forearm because I personally believe that deep fascia also needs to be released. And you can see in this slide that it's released through and through. And then we do the same thing distally and we always look for the motor nerve and my cursor is pointing at the motor nerve. And then we give a padded dressing for 48 hours and mobilize the people. The issue arises when there is a thinner wasting. Is primary opponents plasty justified? This is the kind of picture one gets. You try to tell them to abduct and they will try every trick in the book, but they are unable to abduct the thumb and touch your pen. A very brief literature review. Some of the greats of hand surgery like Guy Fouché, for example, said muscle wasting is common in long-standing severe carpal tunnel and unfortunately it rarely recovers. Their group proposed a simultaneous opponent's plasty. Similarly, the doyen of plastic and hand surgery in the United States, J. William Littler, felt that in long-standing cases of carpal tunnel with thinner atrophy, recovery of opposition was not possible. Again, proposed primary opponent's plasty. I'm going to show you some more recent literature which is now saying different things. So this is uh, not from hand and plastic surgery. This is from the physicians, muscle and nerve groups. So this study was in Sweden where they said uh, the elderly operated patient had significant improvement after surgery in all sensory variables and a decrease in motor nerve latency, which means the motor nerve too was improving. Similarly, this study from Japan for the first time gave an objective assessment. So the conclusion was opponent's plasty may not be necessary in patients with second lumbrical disturbed motor latency of 8 milliseconds or less. In fact, we have started using this criteria. Otherwise, if this is not present, we don't do an opponent's plastic. And finally, a study from India in 2019, Journal of Hand Surgery, it said patients suffering from severe CTS with thinner atrophy and detectable CMAP showed promising improvement following open carpal tunnel release. So, seems to support what I'm saying. So like the bard, also known as Shakespeare said, to do or not to do, that is the question. This is my personal opinion. I almost never do a primary opponent's plasty. I've seen almost all patients recover opposition between eight months to an year, including one lady with a history of 22 years who refused an opponent's plasty. Opponents plus T also brings added cost and time implications. This is the current philosophy. This is an electrophysiology report from our hospital. And for the right median nerve, it says terminal latency to second lumbrical is greater than 8 milliseconds, suggesting poor prognosis, hence an opponents plus T may be considered. If we get a report like this, and only if we get a report like this, do we consider an opponents plus T. We prefer the CAMIDS procedure. So we take an incision continuous with the palmaris longus. And this is the palmar fascia. This is the palmar fascia extension. And now I have kept the extended palmaris longus here. I have opened the carpal tunnel. And I bring your attention to these three vectors that I always show when I'm doing an opponent's plasty. This is the abductor policies brevis vector, this is the opponent's vector, and this is the flexor policies brevis vector. If you want good pronation of the thumb in your opponent's plus T and not only abduction, it is preferable to use the opponent's vector so that you get a rotation at the saddle joint or the CMC joint. So I'm just showing you, I have <clears throat> therefore isolated not the APB but the OPB over here. I make a pulley in the roof of the carpal tunnel and this is the OPB. I pull the palmaris through that pulley and stitch it. And if you see now the pulp of the thumb is facing the pulp of the ring finger. So I have achieved the pronation in addition to the abduction. And this is the still photo and this is showing the good pronation and pulp to pulp pinch. So to conclude, I do not prefer primary opponent's plasty. In my experience, thinner muscles recover. 
Interestingly, patients often are unaware of their loss of opposition because they are compensating with FPB, FPL, all kinds of things. In exceptional circumstances, when I get a report like I showed you, I do a CAMIDS procedure simultaneously. I want to thank the ENS, EANS and Professor Karthik Krishna. It's been an honor and a privilege. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for your great presentation. I have a question for you in terms of what are the downside of this openoplasty? How long does it take to do? And is there any like significant complication related to that procedure? I, in my hands, it takes about half an hour extra. So it doesn't take too long. And there are no significant complications. There can be a less than adequate result if your pulley is not right or if your tensioning is not right. But typically, there are no complications. Okay. It might There's leave a other... dissatisfied patient if the opposition is not restored adequately. Any other questions? Hello. Mariano. Hello, Lee. Hello, Mukun. Hi. Hi. How are you? I'm very uh, very Mukun, thank you very yeah. much for your talk. As always, very clear um, and, 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 and very crystal. Uh, I, I want to know if uh, I understood that you don't perform open endoplasty as a primary procedure in the first time, but when do you decide to do it when you uh, see no recovery of the uh, opponent's uh, function in a patient. When typically, do you do it? Typically 8 to 12 months. 8 to 12 months after the primary release. I will repeat an electrophysiology and if the electrophysiology comes back as complete denervation, then I will tell okay. the patient you are not recovering and I need to do an opponent's plastic. In fact, when I do a carpal tunnel on patients who have a report of a severe carpal tunnel, I warn them that if they don't recover, they might need an opponent's plastic. But I also tell them that in my experience, the large majority do recover. So you go first to the to an, an EMC in order to validate your clinical uh, yes. lack of, of opposition. Yes. Right. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. All right. So Dr. Tat, do you want to um, introduce the next speaker? Yes. It's my pleasure to introduce Mr. Michael Fox who is a consultant at the Royal National Orthopedic Hospital in Stanmore and a peripheral nerve and brachial plexus surgeon from London. Michael, please. Thank you very much, Makunda. That's very kind. And thank you very much, um, Christian, uh, Kartik rather, for uh, inviting me. Very much appreciated. I'm the elephant in the room as being an orthopedic surgeon and uh, speaking to a whole load of um, neurosurgeons. So I'm, it's, a, it's a, an honor and a privilege to do so. I'm going, to, I'm going to run through um, some post-surgical compression neuropathies, by which I mean entrapment that we see following surgical interventions of one kind or another. And I'm going to run through their quite simple cases, but I'm going to try and bring through the common things that we see and the things that concern us. Um, and I'm going to do that with a few quick cases um, where we only have 10 minutes. So this is a, a first case, a 16-year-old child who's fallen over, um, a fracture of the radius and ulna, reduced where, and they stuck a, a, a retrograde nail and post-operatively um, we have clear paresthesia and an ulnar nerve distribution um, and this I use this case to, as an example of the common type of referral we get where motor function was difficult to accept uh, too difficult to assess inverted commas and this is unfortunately quite a common feature we get from our orthopedic colleagues where we, we have not had a clear pre-intervention um, assessment before the patient is referred to us. And I think that's something that we've, we probably, I suspect that's a worldwide issue. Um, and so we have a, an opportunity to follow up and see if anything is changing. We don't know in the case of a closed fracture, um, uh, we can assess with an MRI scan, of course we can, or in the case, uh, Christian would probably say, do an ultrasound scan, he'd probably be right. Um, but we don't all have that same sort of um, intervention available to us. So this is six weeks post-injury, still paresthesia, no improvement in muscle power. But I think the important thing from my point of view is there's a non-progressive to nails. And where we have a complete injury to a nerve, I think we, were, we can fairly uh, reliably assess that and know that's the case. But when we have these partial injuries or entrapments, sometimes it's more subtle. Um, and here we have 
uh, nerve that's been sucked into the fracture site, involved in a fracture, which of course is not just the bone, but is the whole soft tissue envelope. Um, and you can see that once freed up, the nerve structurally is intact and uh, recovery can occur. Whereas in that situation, with the ongoing constriction and firm hold in scar tissue, the nerve cannot. And that is the, a function of prolonged conduction block. Um, and this is another example of a supracondylar fracture. Again, prolonged conduction block, secondary to scar, surgical release, and it works. As opposed to an eight-year-old, this, eight, eight, sorry, this is an eight-year-old girl with a mid-shaft radius null fracture angulated by 45 degrees. Again, reduced promptly, but this has no sensation in the ulnar claw hand straight afterwards. Um, and again, non-progressive tenels. And the difference, and interestingly here, she did have a tenels, implying that the nerve is sufficiently superficial that you can still strike it with your finger and a partial fascicular lesion on release. With the kid, not particularly, not particularly painful, did not have um, a massively um, um, neuropathic pain in her hand. 50, this next case, um, I'm using this one to demonstrate incomplete reduction of fragments of bone. This is something else that worries us when we see it. So this is three months following an open reduction internal fixation uh, of a mid-shaft humeral fracture. Um, so we look at that anterior posterior radiograph. Obviously we're concerned about uh, radial nerve postoperatively in these circumstances. And that sort of image concerns me as it does in a non-union situation where the, where the humerus has been fixed in internal rotation. And we are concerned about the lateral intermuscular septum and the nerve at that point. In this case, I use this case to demonstrate the fact that this, this lady had a tenels at the end of a surgical scar. So when we see a non-progressive tenel or at the end of a surgical scar, that has to raise the possibility that the surgeon has not visualized the nerve at the extent of the scar. And in this case, um, the plate is often slid down from the access of the scar and, it, and it's just um, entrapping the radial nerve. Um, but again, once released uh, uh, and after a few minutes, the thing started to stimulate. So tenels at the end of a surgical scar, another thing that concerns us. Intervention does not have to be um, opening the skin and surgical. This was a nerve palsy following application of um, a brace, um, nerve in the fracture, brace applied, nerve stops working. Um, this is a slightly more unusual case where a gentleman had a, a mid-shaft humeral fracture, again treated conservatively in a brace, but a surgical intervention. So they were, and then his radial nerve stopped working after a few days, but clearly good documentation initially saying that the nerve was working and after a couple of days, not working. No particular tenel sign. But again, if you look at the location of the fracture, you look at the abundant callus, one has to be concerned that um, that may be involved, the nerve may be involved at that level, be it compressed secondarily, because often this distal fragment is internally rotated. And when that's the case, the lateral intermuscular septum can sometimes be pulling tightly down on the nerve and causing a secondary conduction block. Interestingly, in this case, uh, nerve above, nerve below, uh, we have a small bridge of callus crossing the nerve, holding it tightly, that's bony bridge, um, and not allowing the nerve to recover. But again, um, an entrapment rather than a, a focal injury to the nerve. And interestingly, no tenels because you're effectively striking onto the bone and not the nerve itself when percussing in that area. Um, sometimes the X-ray alone worries you. Um, if you see this approach and a patient has a post-operative uh, radial nerve palsy, then obviously you're concerned there may be something going on. This is not so much an entrapment as a destruction of the radial nerve with the nerve securely plated and then screwed to the humerus. Um, I'll use that as an example where, again, there was no tenels because the nerve is, you cannot access the nerve through the plate. This is my last case. And I use this to demonstrate entrapment of a nerve causing significant neuropathic pain. This is a reverse principle shoulder replacement um, and you may or may not know that in order to access the anterior part of the shoulder joint, you have to open the capsule, the lateral aspect of the um, coracoid and the um, conjoint tendon. This patient was complaining of burning neuropathic pain onto the lateral cutaneous nerve of the forearm and into the hand. 
and had weakness of elbow flexion. Um, and here we see the plexus medially. And this is the muscular cutaneous nerve, which has been entrapped and included in the repair of the anterior capsule. And I think they probably thought this was the long head of biceps. Um, but um, again, and, and in these, this circumstance, this lady had been aggressively rehabilitated with physiotherapy to try and move this joint. And you can imagine that's pulling on the entire plexus and with significant neuropathic pain. So sustained neuropathic pain in a peripheral nerve distribution is my last point for concerns about post-operative entrapment neuropathies. So my high index of suspicion is raised when there's a non-progressive tenals, sustained neuropathic pain, you can read it, um, and following incomplete reduction of fragments. Thank you very much. Thank you, Michael. That was a lovely collection of cases, and the last one takes the cake, putting <laughs> the muscular cutaneous inside the capsule. I have a quick question for you. You haven't really mentioned progressive neurophysiology examinations. Do you not believe in them? Or? Yeah, no, um, we, we do it. I don't, it's not really um, time in the context of this talk in 10 minutes to go through them all. But um, I think in most of those cases, um, where there has been a surgical intervention and there is a post-surgical intervention nerve palsy, I think mm -hmm. one is really obligated to intervene. So I, I think it's almost regardless I, you, um, of, of the neurophysiology. If you, and I think as a, as a lesson for the young surgeons, if you have done something to a patient and then you have caused um, a nerve injury, you are obligated to explore or refer it on to somebody who is going to do so. In the case of the gentleman where it was uncertain and there was good documented history uh, of normal radial nerve function, um, and then it developed after the, the, the splint was uh, applied to his humerus. They had, of course, done neurophysiology. I just didn't include it in this. I think that's a good question. And do you do you like to see the musculoskeletal sonography to trace the nerve because that might give you the imaging and tell you? Yes, and that's yeah. why I referred to to um, Christian's work, who's nice and we're neatly going to segue into next, um, because I think that that is the one thing. Having heard, in fact, having heard Christian talk about it over the last few years. That is the one thing that has um, significantly changed, I think, is absolutely. And I think, but you have to have a, either be able to do it yourself or have a very good and reliable um, team um, who can trace it in. Um, I think in some of those nerves, when there is a subtle constriction, it's not always 100% reliable um, in my experience, but then I don't have the same sort of team that Christian has. Okay. If I just make a comment, I think the neurophysiology sometimes is a curse in these cases because you can see some improvement and then you, the neurologist will tell the patients to wait because the nerve is recovering and then you will keep on watching the nerve not recovering for, for a month and month and month and then they will tell the patient, oh, now it's too late, I'm sorry. So I think uh, you need to be very critical with the neurophysiology. It's a useful tool for sure in, in hands of people who know to interpret the, um, the results. And yes, you know that I love the ultrasound and it's very easy to do and very easy to learn, especially if, if, if uh, somebody, somebody like you knows where the nerves are and how they usually look like. So you have the, you know, the anatomical understanding uh, and this is, I mean, this is the, the helpful thing. Of course, there are limitations, especially in the early phase when there's a lot of edema and swelling, then you will have problems to really properly visualize the nerve so to assess it in the in the right way so yeah. short-term clinical and uh, sonographical controls might be uh, a good way to choose one yeah. last quick question to you michael yeah. in some of your nerves i noticed a lot of particular hemorrhages and thickening of the epineurium do you like to split the epineurium or you don't do that um, I generally don't. There are some circumstances when I do. It depends on those long traction lesions, then I do. So, for example, in the where we get common perineal nerve injuries with knee dislocations, um, where it is grossly thickened, then yes, absolutely. But I think that's very much a, a palpation. You know, you, you want to feel. You, uh, I, so, with, for this reason, I think for some of those nerve decompressions, I always struggle to understand how these can be done endoscopically because. For me, I want to feel the nerve. 
and 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 I totally agree for that reason. So, so occasionally, yes. Thank you, Mike. Oh, sorry. No, sorry. Please go on. Do you have any experience with MRI neurography, uh, especially uh, 1.5 Tesla for uh, tractography of the nerve, like uh, near the uh, hardware? And what do you do with your hardware? Like, do you try to remove it when possible to make sure that the um, there will not be a second injury from the removal in, uh, of the hardware later on when you repair the nerve? Yeah, it's a good it's a good question. Well, obviously, I'm a peripheral nerve surgeon, but I come from an orthopedic background. So the only fractures I now fix are ones where there is an associated nerve injury. So yeah, I'm I'm entirely happy to to either remove, refix, or amend. And in some cases, we you don't want to render the particularly when you have to graft a nerve, you don't necessarily want to render the skeleton unstable. But we do sometimes find ourselves cutting plates back, removing screws. Or, or readjusting fixation for sure. Yeah, no, no doubt. Um, and the second and the first part of your question in terms of MR um, tractography, yeah, we um, we don't have as much experience as other people of it, but it's certainly something I would consider. And I I have increasingly in the last five six years used more MR and a lot more ultrasound. And we have uh, certainly in the in my private practice, I have an ultrasonographer um, who sits in a room opposite. And I found increasingly useful for a number of different reasons. Thank you. Michael, will you introduce the next speaker, please? Yes, it would be my great pleasure to, uh, to introduce Christian Heinen, who's a professor working at the Oldenburg University, one of the um, oldest, one, one of the uh, most highly regarded universities in northwestern Germany. And he has an extensive background in publishing in uh, not only nerve tumors for, in the peripheral nerve, but uh, high intensity ultrasound um, endoscopy. Um, and um, bits of the brain I know, I'm delighted to say I know nothing about. So um, over, to, but today he's going to talk to us about pudendal neuralgia, which is something that uh, I think has probably plagued all of us to a greater or lesser extent. And I very much look forward to hearing what he has to say about it. So over to you, Christian. Thanks so much. Um, thank you, Michael. Thank you very much. Uh, are the slides visible in the, the pointer? I hope so. Yes, they are. Yes, absolutely. Okay, perfect. So uh, I will talk about pudendal neuralgia. This is actually one of the uh, compression neuropathies uh, only few people want to deal with. Uh, I was very reluctant to do it uh, too, but you know the patients come. And in some patients, you will find a very long history, like in this uh, gentleman. Can you put on the presentation, please? Presentation mode. We just see the notes. Oh, I'm sorry. Is it better? Hit start. Hit start. Stop there. Go up yes. Is it better? Yes, that's perfect. 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 Okay, okay perfect. I'm sorry. So uh, usually the patients have a long history of pain. And of course the pain is in regions that you know people do not tend to uh, talk about freely and, and like on back pain or anything like that. So uh, the, the way uh, people are um, uh, hampered by their, by their pain and by their dysfunctions uh, is something that goes very deep into life quality of the patients. So what we actually wanted to find out was uh, if we do uh, pudendal nerve decompression, if this has anything, any impact on the life quality of our patients. So this, uh, the patient I picked out because his, the finding was quite interesting, had a long history of pain. He was a uh, um, surgeon um, uh, in the, his late 60s, so he had done a lot of sitting and standing surgeries, and he presented with a long history of pain in the typical field of the pudendal nerve supply. Um, he went through, I don't know, uh, myriads of, of, of doctors uh, trying to find out what his, what his problem was. So of course, first he went to the urologist and they couldn't find anything, but they treated him for a um, prostate infection, chronic prostate infection with months of um, uh, antibiotics, but it didn't work. So we went to the next and to the next and so on and so on. And finally went to, was referred to a psychologist because everybody was thinking that he was crazy. This psychologist, however, was the one who was believing the patient that his pain was real. And he uh, tried to uh, find out uh, somebody and, and, uh, to, uh, to have this patient treated. So in, um, in, um, uh, in Germany, we have only a few centers dealing with these problems. And one is nearly 300 kilometers from here. 
and what they do is they test the patients. So they, first of all, they do in men, they do the Botox injection under uh, X-ray and uh, block the pudendal nerve. And uh, doing that, he had an, uh, a clear improvement. So they do not do surgery. So they sent the patient to us and um, we, uh, we, as we have a long going cooperation with, uh, with these colleagues, we trust their uh, results. So we started to operate on them. Um, in our institution, we prefer uh, the uh, dorsal transgluteal decompression route because um, as he had pain in all three branches, in all three regions of the pudendal nerve, to ours, to, and this is most of the patients, um, uh, we want to go for the, the, you know, the main trunk of the nerve. So this is why we choose the, the uh, dorsal transgluteal approach. So the, this is what we are, how the surgery is planned. You have the midline, you have the oscoxygus, and then you go, uh, you can, in most of the patients, not the obese one, you can uh, uh, palpate the uh, tuberosity, and you do, uh, this incision is more or less imitating the, the course of the sacrotubular ligament. So you can palpate it because it's like an uh, elastic resistance in the depth. Um, we then uh, split apart bluntly the, um, uh, the gluteal muscles after skin incision so that we don't cut the muscles, we just split them apart and go for the, go for the sacrotubial ligament. So this is cranial and this is uh, caudal and you see the overhold uh, underneath the sacrotubial um, ligament. This is what you can see here. It's, this is now being coagulated and then uh, cut step by step under a microscopic uh, vision. So we don't do this uh, macroscopically. We always do this with, uh, well, we are neurosurgeons, so I, I'm used to microscope. You can use the lens, of course, the, uh, as well. This is just to have magnification. So after splitting, you already can see the, the fat body. And what uh, appears here is, there, there you can see the vasa nervorum of the uh, pudendal nerve. And you see these all these uh, now small, but then I will show you later on some, some bigger uh, varix, uh, varicosic um, veins that uh, uh, compress the nerve as well. So you can see here how the uh, situs develops. And this is the process of the, uh, this is like, an, like a second impingement of the um, sacrotubial ligament to the nerve. This is the nerve under, underneath it. And this is, the, was, I think, the main compression site in this case. So it's all been dissected. And so the very vex uh, vein is uh, freed, then prepared, coagulated. And in the end, you will have a nice decompression of the nerve. As you can see here, it runs freely to the, uh, to the caudal parts. And we've been operating uh, on, in total, 29 patients. Of them, 25 were included due to follow-up. And in them, we had 31 surgeries. And as you can see, we prefer the dorsal transglutal um, uh, approach rather than the ventral ones. These were the ones that were not um, benefiting from first surgery. So they, after long discussions, we, we um, decided to do uh, this, you know, the distal um, access to, to have a complete decompression of the nerve. In one of them, it helped. And in one of them, it did not help. Interestingly, uh, and this is a frequent finding that the patients um, present with non really site specific uh, symptoms, but they rather, I mean, in this region, I think it's quite difficult to really, you know, draw the line using uh, left and right. So in some patients we had, or in nearly half of the patients, we had the bilateral decompression. Uh, one of our uh, physician assistant, Janet, she developed uh, for her master thesis, she developed an own questionnaire, including, and this is what we actually aimed for, was to to know what will you know what effect does this uh, this surgery have on the patients, and um, the, the compression side, as I told you, was mostly sacro uh, tuber ligament, and in addition, we found because patients were with primary uh, pudendal nerve, also idiopathic pudendal nerve uh, neuralgias and some were already operated on. So this is why you, where the scarring comes from. And um, 
what we found out was that we, you know, we had, a pos I wasn't expecting that positive uh, effect, but obviously we had one. So I was actually, I was asking Janet to have a results so we could stop uh, pudendal nerve surgery because, uh, you know, it's, it's, you know, quite time consuming, the, not the surgery itself, but the, the, the dealing with the patients. But obviously, this is, uh, this is something helpful in, in, in the patients. Of course, not everybody is, uh, is uh, benefiting from it, but uh, in overall, um, uh, and this is, I think this is what, so we try to capture what for the patients, what's, what really matters for the patients is if they can live their life in free time and if they have an overall increase in, in, in well-being. So the conclusion is yes, the decompression of this nerve can help. Thank you. Thanks, Christian. Um, so I, I'll, I'll moderate any discussions. Are there any questions people would like to ask particularly? I know I have a couple. Um, one is that um, I know our colleagues in France, in Nantes, um, have, have a big series of from their pelvic pain center. And they, they sort of report around 25% of their, um, their bigger series, their biggest series have varix. For those patients in, you, in your series, do you think the scarring is because of previous surgeries due to var uh, varicosities or do you, how does that tally? So where the scarring comes from? Yeah, just, I mean, what do you think about that? Is 25% var uh, varices as a, as a cause? It seems quite high to me. I, I just, but, it doesn't seem to be borne out in your series. Yes, no, no, I, I, I agree. I think this is, I mean, I only can, you know, tell from our patients, but a 25% uh, var varix rate is really high. And I mean, they have large numbers. They have the, the largest series of, of uh, all pudendal nerves publicated. So if that's, that's in their experience, I mean, they set quite clear uh, clinical criteria and we use them, the non-criteria for the assessment of this, of the patients. And I think they're very useful because they are very coming from the, you know, the clinical part and from a lot of experience. So the scarring in our uh, patients were mainly from uh, gynecolo uh, gynecological uh, um, surgeries. Oh, right, okay. because, because the women were operated for their pain because the gynecologists were thinking this was a dissensus uteri or whatever, you know, some, some uh, you know, gynecolo gynecological um, problems. And same was for the men after following prostate uh, surgery or prostate irradiation. We have two patients, men, that suffered from severe pain uh, after irradiation and after freeing the, the nerves from the um, the irradiation induced scar they improved so so uh, Kartik has a question go ahead oh, I, I don't want to interrupt just go on go on finish here no go ahead. please Kartik please okay so I want to ask whether uh, the vein that you showed is it really a pathological varicose vein uh, and um, is that not a, a, a vena committantus an accompanying vein of the nerve uh, and is it is it the true reason for compression? So I think we always find this. Con uh, so there's always a vessel in, the, in an artery and a vein, um, you know, going uh, with the nerve. Always we always find them, but we never found uh, a vein this enlarged. And you are right. I don't think that this is was the compression site, but I think it was part of the compression. So it's it's uh, you know it's a three D space. And the nerve is compressed within the two ligaments, and having even less space because of the varix, and maybe to some, you know, venous congestion of the due to hampered uh, venous drainage, might uh, might have been playing a part too in this pathology. But I I agree, it's not the only pathology in this patient, so it was part of it. And another question, uh, Christian, in terms of your, do you think the benefit is sustained? And how long is your follow up for those patients, for that patient group? So we follow them up at least for three years. Okay. So the, this was one, uh, this was, I, I, I'm, I'm not quite sure it was two or 2.5 years of follow up. 
and he he was happy and so he was not pain free but he was significantly pain reduced so um pain free is i think is a fairy tale to tell the patients i think pain free is after especially after these long years of suffering and you know they will mm, all of them uh, appeared you know they need to pro process their pain and i think this is doing something with the persons too and they some of them or a lot of them have a, a certain primary personality that maybe mm, makes them more uh, prone to have uh, to suffer more or to have more pain you know so i think pain free is a fairy tale so Christian, I have two questions. First of all, I want to congratulate you to uh, deal with uh, those patients. <laughs> and uh, I'd like to know what type of images uh, you're getting for those patients prior to surgery. And secondly, like, you know, what's the rehab looks like? Like, do you have a multidisciplinary team with psychologists? Like, uh, what, what does it look like? So the imaging part is, is really, really uh, bothering us because um, there are I mean, there are a few works uh, from a few groups that, for a mark at least, that they tell that they can really display uh, the nurse perfectly. I never seen these images. And talking to experts, like, I mean, Mariano has, uh, for example, Daniela at his side for, for perfect imaging, um, talking to her because uh, she doesn't know how to, uh, to do it. So, you know, I, I, I was, I'm not convinced with the MR. There are uh, Italian groups for, from Tagliafico. Uh, they use ultrasound and they produce fantastic papers. But um, I don't know what kind of people they do ultrasound on, but the median uh, Northwest German um, back or lower back is usually not accessible for, for high resolution ultrasound. So this is a huge problem. Uh, and it's really difficult. And in the end, in a lot of cases, we talk to the patients telling them, okay, this, this, that's the possibility we have to decompress the nerve, even though we don't have a modality of imaging to really prove that there is a compression. We always do uh, MR for excluding tumors and uh, or other pathologies, yes, but not for the uh, uh, compression side itself. So and Christian. the rehab, I'm sorry, the rehab. So, uh, the, so we sent them all to pain therapeutics uh, to have, um, uh, because they're not all, all uh, not everybody's coming from uh, from our region. So we sent them to the local pain centers and uh, let them cure, uh, be, be, because it's, well, doing surgery only will not be enough for sure. So it's only part of the uh, treatment. The, uh, a small variation of in our um, uh, series is we parallelly implant a stimulator and externalize it and see and during the post-operative phase we do the stimulation test stimulation and see whether it helps and in, in, in cases it if it helps to reduce pain medication then we'll implant a implant a stimulator. The peripheral nerve stimulator. But what, what do you think about it? Should, because going back a second time is going to be always more difficult than just implanting a test stimulator and just pulling it out. Yes, of course. So I think so. This is some uh, something we talk about with the patients prior to surgery. So we let them know that this there is this possibility and. I, the, the colleagues that uh, I told you were in the other hospital about 300 kilometers from here, it's called Herne, the place, they do the stimulation. So if, and they have a huge experience with that. So, uh, uh, and they developed and published on the technique how they uh, uh, put the electrodes. So um, we talk to the patients and let them choose. And in a lot of cases the patients first go there and then come to us or vice versa so they always have both opinions but no 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 i, I don't mean i don't mean dorsal cord stimulation i, I mean peripheral no, nerve no, stimulation no, i implant no. exactly right no, on the nerve so-called star technique to to place the electrodes it's it's not it's pudendal only it's not a spinal cord it's yeah, okay. 
it's it's uh, targeted for dental uh, stimulation. Oh. But what they, what they say is that uh, for the, uh, for example, for the um, post um, traumatic or, or post surgery uh, pudendal uh, uh, neuralgia, the their stimulation has limitations, so they prefer to send them for decompression. In primary, they you know it's about uh, it's up to the patient to choose, but in, for the secondary. The, the patients get re referred to, you know, to for real, real decompression. I mean, for for mechanical decompression. Perfect. Uh, any? If there are any other questions at this time, just Christian. Mariano. Oh, thank you, uh, Christian. Hello, how are you? Just to uh, clarify, for, perhaps for the audience, thanks for bringing this uh, eventual uh, surgical treatment. Uh, com nerve compression uh, with good ev eventual good results. So, uh, can you resume very briefly your uh, pre-op uh, workup uh, uh, backup in order to uh, determine which patient is a good candidate for surgery and which one knows? Do you use MRI? Do you use uh, blockades and the ultrasound and so on? So, for the uh, for the women. We have, uh, we are lucky that in our uh, hospital here, we have the head of our gynecologist uh, department and he's, he knows, he still knows how to do pudendal blocks. Uh, so this is number one. Then every, everybody needs to present and for the men, it's doing the radiologist via CT. Uh, the uh, preoperative pre blockade twice. Uh, then everybody needs to present with, with an MR, everybody. And everybody, depending women or men, needs to present with a urological or gynecological uh, uh, exam. So we want to exclude all this. And of course, uh, we, according to the Nant uh, criteria, we use them. We want to at least have ful fulfilled the, the main criteria. And of course, as everybody knows uh, who's dealing with these patients, that you will always have patients who are somewhere in between. or they come to you and ask for, you know, for help. So it sometimes is really difficult to not have surgery on them and to explain why you wouldn't do it. So it's difficult. And of course, uh, there's not a good solution as you already alluded to. <laughs> ah, okay. But Thank what you I wanted much. to know that we can, at least we can help somehow. Yeah. Yes, yes, I do agree. Thank you very much. Does anyone have any uh, experience with DRG for those uh, patients instead of PNS? Yeah. Oh. The only one I know no. doing this for Pudendal is uh, Walter Demel from Munich. But only few cases and well, I think his result, he told me that the results are more or less like everybody's results dealing with with these patients. Uh, yes. I think there are no everybody in this uh, <laughs> in this field, the, number one. Number two, uh, the, the patients are so frustrated that uh, they just, uh, you know, anything is justified. And in the chat, uh, Alan Forster uh, uh, is uh, mentioning the uh, to use um, specific, specific neurophys neurophysiology. This is absolutely true. So what he's what uh, what Mr. Foster is, is telling, but uh, I have no access or to a neurologist nearby doing this kind of um, these kind of examinations pre-op. We do intra-op monitoring with uh, sphincter EMG, but pre-op we can't do it. So he's right, but I don't have it. We also I think have. You had a question, didn't you? Yeah. No, no. I would like to say we also have a few questions in a Q and A uh, chat, so we can leave this for the end uh, for discussion. Since we are uh, running quite good, uh, uh, this webinar is nicely and smoothly on time. Oh, good. Turn on your micro microphone, Mukun. In the Q and A, there is a question from me for me from Dr. Mari Hockbridge about opponents plus key, if the palmaris longus is missing, what would you do? 
in which case we would use other donors like extensor indices proprius or a flexor digitorum sublimis, one of the other standard donors for opponents plus. I hope that answers the question. Okay, um, Lucas, do you want to move on to the next talk? Yeah, yeah, I would like to I would recommend to move on and we have a few questions we can discuss in a- in Later on, okay. Uh, so, Christian, you should introduce the next speaker. Yes. So, it's my great pleasure to introduce Dimitri Nakonechny. Um, nice to have you with us. And um, we are looking very forward to, uh, to have his talk about late secondary reconstruction of grip. Thank you very much. Спасибо большое. Я благодарю организационный комитет за возможность участия и возможность показать наш поучительный кейс. Thank you very much, and I would like to thank the organizing committee for giving me this opportunity to present my case. И отдельная благодарность профессору Карти Кришнан за возможность и помощь в коммуникации, которая несколько пострадала. Thank you very much. Go on. Итак, у меня нет нечего заявить о конфликте интересов. I don't have Однако... any conflicts of interest to disclose, however. Однако есть небольшой конфликт интересов касательно восстановления плечевого сплетения среди нейрохирургии и ортопедии. There are uh, indeed some conflicts of interest or some differences in views between neurosurgeons and orthopedic surgeons when it comes to the reconstruction of brachial plexus. Поскольку есть на первый взгляд несколько разная философия. Since there, there are different philosophies dealing with the reconstruction of brachial plexus. Однако общие цели благородны и достаточно схожи. Our general goal is to provide the patient with an improvement in his quality of life. И если говорить о классических ортопедах, то они представляют себе руку. When we talk about classic orthopedic surgeons, they uh, they uh, they think more about the joints and the kinesiology of the joints. Да, как некую кинезиологическую или кинематическую цепь. И при рассмотрении руки в таком качестве для восстановления нам нужно провести определение дефектов этой цепи. So the orthopedic surgeons look more into uh, viewing the arm as a chain of kinesiological joints which require reconstruction of the motor units. Провести подсчет оставшихся сохранными моторных единиц. And to uh, reallocate uh, the motor units which are available and which need to be reconstructed. Выбрать uh, возможных из них доноров. And to choose the proper donors. И при необходимости упростить, упростить нашу uh, кинезиологическую цепь для решения and, проблемы. And to simplify the kinesiological chain as uh, much as possible to achieve the goal of reanimating the arm чтобы сэкономить моторные единицы. So that, so as to preserve the motor unit. Итак, наш кейс. Это пациент достаточно молодой, с десятилетним стажем после повреждения брахиал плексус. This is our case where the, it's a young patient with a brachial plexus injury 10 years ago. На момент госпитализации его устраивает функция плеча и локтевого сустава. Uh, he had 
uh, quite a good recovery of the shoulder and elbow joints. Они достигнуты в результате предыдущих множества неевральных реконструкций. Uh, that which was achieved by neurosurgical reconstruction of the brachial plexus, uh, multiple neurosurgical reconstruction of the brachial plexus and the nerves. И в этот раз запрос пациента – это функция кисти. And at this time, the patient wanted an improvement in the function of his hand. Без которой он рукой uh, практически не пользуется. Uh, without uh, reconstruction of the hand function, uh, the reanimated function of the arm is useless. К этому времени uh, уже uh, были использованы uh, всевозможные графты нервов. Uh, till this time, all kinds of grafts had already been performed. И также невральные доноры для реконструкции. And also axonal donors had been utilized. Пациент больше не настроен чем-либо жертвовать. A patient was not ready to sacrifice any of the functions which had been reconstructed so far. Из моторных единиц, доступных для транспозиции, у него есть только брахиоредиалис и ECRL. So, uh, among the motor units which could be transferred, he had a good brachioradialis function and the extensor carpi radial, long, long extensors of the, of the wrist. Учитывая пожелание пациента, мы выбрали примитивный вариант. The patient wished a very primitive a kind of reconstruction. They chose, a primitive, they chose a primitive reconstruction uh, option for this patient because he wanted to, he didn't want to sacrifice any motor functions. Uh, and we did TNADs with the fingers and the fingers on the level of the brain. Uh, thus, they did a tenodesis of the Uh, flex, uh, deep flexors at the level of um, the radius, distal third of the radius. They anchored the deep flexors to the distal third of the radius. И также тенадезы FDS на проксимальной фаланге. And they also did uh, tenodesis of the of the superficial flexors at the proximal fal. Это дало пациенту удовлетворяющий его захват, и он пошел к терапевту кисти. Uh, this was able to provide the patient with an acceptable dripping function, and he was referred to the physical therapist to um, enhance his function. Однако терапевт не обладал опытом в реабилитации пациентов после таких операций. However, the physical therapist did not have a dedicated experience in rehabilitating such patients after such kinds of surgery. И воспринял результат операции как контрактуру. He conceived, he thought that the result of this kind of operation is actually a contracture. Которую он просто исправил, разорвав. And he tried to correct the contracture and thus, uh, thus ruptured the tenodesis to the radius. Для, для решения этой проблемы нам пришлось повторно брать пациента на операцию. И, к счастью, в этот раз он uh, был чуть более настроен на транспозиции. Um, in order to correct this situation, which has happened due to a, uh, due to a mistake or mistaken conception, uh, we took him back to the surgery. Uh, because of the positive results of the first surgery, he developed more trust and he allowed us to use one motor unit for the following surgery. Он разрешил нам использовать брахиоradialis uh, для uh, FDP. 
he allowed us to use the brachioradial tendon for transferring to the deep flexors of the fingers. Пациент получил удовлетворяющий его э, цилиндрический захват и отказался от других э, дополнительных реконструкций. Uh, he had a good cylindrical grip function and uh, after that he declined any further uh, reconstructive measures because uh, this was satisfactory for the patient. Он не захотел вмешательства на первом пальце или коррекцию clawing hand. Uh, he did not prefer uh, opponent's plasty or uh, thumb uh, reanimation. Also, he declined uh, a claw hand correction. Таким образом, пациент, который, то есть этот 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 опыт нас научил многому. И да. This uh, this experience taught us a lot. Uh, Во-первых, пациент может не пользоваться со всем рукой, если он не может что-либо в нее взять. Это может иметь значение для выстраивания стратегии реконструкции uh, движений в руке. This is one of the reasons why the strategy of reconstruction of reanimating the function, loss function of the hand is so important. Когда мы делаем вторичную реконструкцию на очень поздних сроках, when we do the secondary reconstruction at very late times, very late period, иногда моторные единицы, которые мы могли бы использовать как доноры, уже теряют свою силу. Uh, say that again, please. Say that again. Еще раз. Еще um, раз так, когда, uh -huh. когда, мы использ... когда мы проводим реконструкцию на очень поздних сроках, uh, мышцы, uh, которые мы могли бы использовать, uh, некоторые из них уже теряют свою силу. Uh, all right. So I'm just going to translate the whole thing now. Uh, one of the disadvantages of doing late secondary reconstruction is because since the patient does not use his hand uh, when the grip function is not there, he tends to achieve or, or attain a disuse atrophy of any type of donor muscles which might have been used for uh, as potentially as suitable donors. И... Uh, если на первых этапах uh, было использовано максимальное количество ресурсов, на uh, последующих этапах иногда это не оставляет нам выбора для последующих реконструкций. Yeah. So uh, if the strategy would involve using all of the uh, donors which are available, then it leaves us very little room uh, for later reconstruction. Mm. Именно поэтому очень важно, чтобы э, на, э, при обсуждении пациента, при первом же его поступлении участвовала вся команда, и реабилитолог, и нейрохирург, и врач-ортопед. For example, neurosurgeons, orthopedic surgeons, physiotherapists consult the patient together and set goals. Uh, обсуждение между нейрохирургом и ортопедом, или если uh, и тот и другой этап делает один человек, uh, позволит uh, более взвешенно uh, использовать ресурсы. It is important that the neurosurgeon and the orthopedic surgeon have enough communication at early stages, or if the, if the patient is being treated by one of the same surgeon, uh, like in many cases, uh, this helps to balance the type of goals and, and, and set the strategies accordingly, right from the beginning. Не делать напрасных жертв. So that we don't, uh, we don't sacrifice unnecessary motor, motor donors. Mm -hmm. Unnecessarily sacrifice motor donors. Минимальное количество моторных единиц uh, может дать uh, пациенту устраивающую его функцию. 
uh, a minimum number of motor donors can give the function that will suit the patient. И очень важно, чтобы физический терапевт имел как минимум опыт, а лучше был в тесном контакте с оперирующим хирургом. Это команда нашего отделения. This is our team. Я... У нас в Санкт-Петербурге очень красиво, и если... Вы приедете, мы будем очень рады вас видеть и обменяться мнениями. Спасибо за внимание большое. И спасибо Карте Кришнам. Christian, can you can you moderate the discussion, please? So, thank you very much for this uh, impressive talk and for pointing out. And I think this is well, this is what Kartik has been alluded to right in the in his in his introduction. That we deal with patients that you know, in most of the times, are not mm, completely treated 100% by one discipline only but that you always need a team before and after and during surgery. So it's not uh, surgery only, but it's, you know, the, the whole uh, setup. So um, what, just from a pr practical point of view, do, they, do you see the patients together with, uh, with your colleagues all the times before and after a surgery in the outpatient? And do you perform the surgeries uh, on a regular basis together, or how is it organized? Как у вас организовано? Вы смотрите на вы смотрите этих больных вместе с нейрохирургами в ваших ваших амбулаторных амбулаторных санитарий и оперируете вместе изначально и потом исследуете вместе для follow-up или как это организовано в вашем институте? Чаще всего происходит таким образом, что либо мы выполняем оба этапа и невральные реконструкции, и ортопедические реконструкции сами, либо эти пациенты попадают нам независимо, просто уже после вмешательства нейрохирургов. Primary and secondary reconstruction ourselves in our department, and uh, sometimes we get referrals from neurosurgeons who had done primary reconstructions elsewhere for second for the purpose of secondary reconstruction to our unit. And is there a, a cutoff of time when you say you would go for? So what is late uh, reconstruction? When when is late starting? Что для вас означает поздняя реконструкция и когда для вас начинается э, терминология поздняя? Что вы считаете поздним? Ну, э, может быть, это просто такое не очень удачное выражение, слово «поздний». Э, касательно этого пациента это точно, наконец, это запоздалая реконструкция. Uh, what concerns this patient whom I had presented in this case, uh, it is a very late reconstruction. Uh, again, the, the word late is, is a, it depends on how you understand. Мы привыкли говорить позднее просто для использовать это слово для вторичной реконструкции. We just use the word late to denote Secondary reconstruction. Okay. Uh, the question was, uh, Dimitri, uh, вопрос был, Dimitri, о том, uh, что является, какой срок для вас является uh, uh, для секундарной реконструкции, для вторичной реконструкции. Обычно, если мы видим пациента на сроках больше 12 месяцев, то мы уже не думаем о невральной реконструкции. So Но... 
we don't think about primary nerve reconstruction anymore further issue pressure no uh иногда мы мы не берем сразу же их на операцию спустя этот срок потому что нам нужно дождаться результата невральной реконструкции которая была сделана до нас uh, иногда uh, sometimes we just wait furthermore so that we see the result of the primary reconstruction performed elsewhere to achieve its goal and only then we go ahead with the secondary reconstruction потому что это может дать нам дополнительные моторные единицы в распоряжении because it will also be able to provide us more motor units which can be used for secondary reconstruction there's one question from the audience from um, Mary uh, Hawkridge and the question is where to begin with the reconstructions if uh, you begin more distally or hand function or if you would aim for uh, aim at arm and shoulder movement so elbow flexion abduction uh, external rotation so is there any kind of is it all individually tailored or do you have some kind of um, uh, you know patterns that you will stick to uh, first of all, I want to thank Mary Violet for, for coming up with these kinds of questions and, and showing herself active. I, I, I love it. I, I absolutely love it. She's, she's one, of our, one of our star residents in our unit. Um, uh, Mary Violet Hockridge uh, хочет спросить, uh, где вы начинаете реконструкцию? Начало с uh, кисти и двигаетесь uh, более проксимально во время секундарной реконструкции, по вторичной реконструкции или наоборот, начинаете от плеча и предплечья и идете э, в сторону кисти. Это бывает очень по-разному, э, в зависимости от того, э, какие функции, может быть, у пациента уже сохранились, э, но э, меня, наверное, основной приоритет – это функция кисти. Uh, answering the question, answering Mary Violet's question, um, it depends on what kind of motor units are available. And for Dr. Nick Nakonechny, it is important to have hand function. Hand function is one of the important things which he prioritizes. И, конечно же, обязательно это сгибание локтевом суставе. And uh, elbow flexion is a very important issue to be reconstructed. Плечо, хоть оно классически у ортопедов да, в проксимальном отделе считается первым для реконструкции, плечевой сустав, мы от, можем отложить это решение этого вопроса на более поздний срок. Although the orthopedic surgeons consider reanimation of the shoulder function as a very important uh, thing, um, they, uh, we rather... Um, prefer to postpone that until further. Потому что пациент с работающим локтем и кистью уже начнет пользоваться рукой. Because the patient who has uh, recovered hand and elbow function starts using his extremity in his everyday life. Mm -hmm. Michael, please. Yeah, uh, so um, in defense of orthopedic surgeons, um, I, I just, I just wanted to say that um, uh, I think I would entirely agree with Dimitri that um, you want to know what's happening with the hand and elbow flexion, and only then do you need to be able to position that hand at, in time and space. And so, I would entirely agree that you would want to see where you are were with hand and elbow function before doing anything for the shoulder. So, I just uh, wanted to know that for orthopedic surgeons, we're thinking like him. So, thank you. Uh, um, uh, Dr. Fox uh, из Лондона uh, сказал, что он думает так же, как вы, Дмитрий, что сначала надо знать, uh, где мы стоим с кистью и с локтевым суставом, только потом можно uh, делать, как его на пространстве uh, расположить эту функцию. Поэтому uh, хотя бы он не ортопед, он думает, что он думает вместе с вами что кисть и локтевой сустав очень важны. And I have a commentary from, from my dear friend Carlos uh, Carlito, 
he says, congratulations for this webinar. I have a question for Dr. Nakonyechny. What is your experience with free functional muscle transfers for hand reconstruction? Carlos Rodriguez Aceves спрашивает вас из Мексико. Какой у вас опыт с свободной функциональной мышечной реконструкцией для реконструкции хватки? Должен признаться, мы free functional muscle использовали только для реконструкции локтя пока. Потому что, ну, это мой личный опыт еще, наверное, не такой большой. Uh, he should confess, uh, Dimitri should confess that he has very little experience with reconstruction of the hand and fingers. However, he uses regularly this type of three functional muscle reconstruction for elbow flexion. So, thank you very much. And we can move on, yeah. Since, uh... All right. So, um, I will take the privilege to introduce uh, my friend and a great surgeon, Mariano Sokolowski. He is a very eminent surgeon from Argentina, from South America, and uh, um, actually in, in, in many parts of the world. Uh, the name Mariano has started to be synonymous with excellence. Uh, you know, he, he has become, uh, you know, people start saying that you are the Mariano of something. You know, this is, this is just amazing. So Mariano, I welcome you and uh, um, uh, I really look forward to your talk. And I, I'm very privileged that I was also, I also played a very little part in this in this publication, which you did, um, although not very much. Please go ahead. Well, Kartik, thank you. Thank you very much for these really kind words. Uh, and uh, thank you, really, without words. So, anyway, I will start. And this is the thing I will speak about uh, long versus short nerve grafts. Uh, this is something that we were studying. Uh, for many years. Ten years ago, in 2011, we published this initial paper about the use of long grafts in brachial plexus reconstruction. So when you use long graft, for example, here, you cut, let's say, the phrenic nerve or whatever, and uh, in a complete brachial plexus injury, for, uh, for example, and uh, then you'll see the, the distal phrenic nerve over there, and you use a long graft directed uh, to the muscular cutaneous, for example. And uh, then you avoid misrouting of the axons and the axons go directly where you really want uh, to, 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 to put them. And you avoid this green uh, misrouting of the axons uh, in intermediate branching uh, nerves. So, when, uh, when you are going to use a long graft, for example, here in the lower back or in the lower part of the image, you see the spinal accessory nerve, and you see here the uh, biceps branch of the muscular cutaneous, you will have to use a very long graft, perhaps 15, 18 centimeters long. So in this uh, first series, uh, what we saw is that the results were com uh, comparable to those other uh, series in terms of elbow re -innervation. This means two thirds good results, one third bad results. In 2015, we present our series on phrenic, um, phrenic nerve as donor, and we use long graft, intermediate graft, and also no graft at all. So if you're not going to use graft at all, you should use, for example, here in this graph, uh, you cut the phrenic nerve and you put it, of course, in a proximal target, like this one in the anterior division of the upper trunk for elbow flexion. This is the distal uh, part of the phrenic nerve and the complete brachial plexus injury. And you have this problem 
you have some misrouting of the nerves that goes to a different target. So this is the diagram uh, of this situation where you put your axons towards different possible targets. So I will uh, show in this, um, in this video, and I'm keeping showing this video for the last years because I, I think I, I influenced with this uh, uh, many or, or some surgeons, uh, but I'm not sure if this influence was positive or negative. So uh, this is a, a very simple uh, and easy nerve suture, phrenic to anterior division to the upper trunk. You put a fish mouth uh, uh, suture and you obtain and you obtain a good renovation. So this is a very simple, you don't need graft flow at all. Is it not possible to do this? Maybe you, use, you need a short graft, but anyway, you solve the problem with a very easy and simple uh, surgical maneuver. But look at this. This is a patient where you see eight, 18 months after the surgery, a weak biceps renovation. But when he inspirates, you see the misrouting of the fibers going to the pectoral nerves, uh, muscles, sorry. Yes, nerves and muscles. So this is one of the eventual problems when you use very proximal targets. Maybe it's not a problem, I don't know, but I just want to put this into your minds. So this is another case, three years after the surgery. Again, you can see good elbow flexor recovery, also very proximal target using anterior division of the upper trunk. Do not, do not look at the shoulder here, look at the elbow flexion, which is uh, uh, very good. Anyway, it's M4. But as you can see here, please look at this. When he flexes the elbow also, there is a contraction of the pectoralis. So this is what I was speaking about, misrouting, using proximal targets. So which is the appropriate strategy? Trying to solve this uh, question, uh, we published this paper this year in 2021, uh, Kartik. Uh, participate on this uh, uh, paper, and I am grateful with him for this. And uh, we analyze uh, this series of patients operated in our country uh, using only two donors just to make the, 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 the more homogeneous the, 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 the study, phrenic and spinal accessory, just that. And using receptors for elbow flexion, which means anterior division of the upper trunk, lateral cord, muscular cutaneous or biceps branch, only for elbow flexion, minimum follow-up, 24 months, dynamometer and index uh, for, uh, for um, control of the results, and of course, an intensive rehab program, program. So here are the targets for elbow flexion, the possible targets, anterior division of the upper trunk, lateral cord, muscular cutaneous, and farther away, the biceps branch of the muscular cutaneous. So we use the dynamometer and we use a, an index comparing the healthy and the affected arm. The maximum possible point was one and the minimum possible was zero. So we compare this and we uh, uh, avoid using the British Medical uh, Council score in order to uh, determine our results. And these are the results. We uh, managed to include in this study uh, 51 pa uh, patients, yes. And uh, by donor nerve, there is a subtle difference, not statistically significant, towards the phrenic nerve being a better donor. And probably this is the most important part. If we use the muscular cutaneous nerve in the middle, you see there is just some tendency towards a better result. If we use the anterior division of the upper trunk, which is a more proximal, a shorter graft, you, we saw this acceptable results. And on the other side, if we use the biceps branch, this means a very distal, a very long graft, they are comparable. So by thanks to surgery, this is the only statistical result we find. And of course, this is fortunate because this validates the whole study because 
uh, time to surgery is all, all already validated as a very important factor or variable. And uh, regarding the length of the graft, look at this, those graphs less than 10 centimeters, I'm sorry, and those which were more than 10 centimeters were, were a bit, a bit better. But anyway, anyway, there is no statistical difference. So just to conclude, in our patients, the length of the graph did not affect negatively uh, the recovery of elbow strength, regardless of the used donor nerve in terms of phrenic or spinal accessory. Anecdotally, greater misrouting was observed using proxy proximal targets. Is this negative? Is this positive? I'm not sure. Clearly, prospective studies with a larger number of patients are necessary in order to validate uh, more accurately these results. Muchas gracias. Mariano, it's, again, it's, it's fantastic. Your, your videos are so didactic. Um, Thank you. Are Thank there you. any questions in the audience? Also through the question and answer session. Um, again, there is a question which I may read aloud. It is, is the sural nerve an appropriate donor? Uh, this is being put forward by uh, Nikhil Takur. Uh, yes, in all our series, we use the Sura Nef uh, graft uh, Niki as donor. Yes, absolutely. We have 46 Again, meters. I want to underline uh, terminology here. When you, when you say donor, um, there are two ways of understanding it. One thing is an accent donor. Other thing is a graft donor. So donor uh -huh. graft. Probably what Dr. Takur meant was the graft. Yeah, same, same to me. Um, I, I was another question by Carlos uh, Rodriguez. Um, I have another question for you to Mariano. How co how how COVID use of phrenic nerve does affect nowadays your strategy for reconstructing? Uh, okay, I'm going to read it out. How does COVID uh, does affect? How does COVID affect nowadays your strategy for reconstruction, complete brachial plexus injury, especially the use of peripheral uh, phrenic nerve? By yes, uh, this is a very very good question, and uh, I'm going to tell you that uh, during the COVID pandemic, we very 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 uh, carefully select our patients. For example, uh, if the patient had uh, is very, uh, as always, if it's young, thin, skinny, and all that, uh, and is a good candidate. Uh, during during the pandemic situation, we try not to use the phrenic nerve as donor. Anyway, anyway, uh, in some cases, for example, after a recent uh, co uh, COVID uh, um, um, uh, infection, we can use it. Or otherwise, if nowadays the patient is already uh, already vac vaccinated. We, we can uh, consider to using it, but we are more careful. This talk is not about using phrenic nerve. This talk is about using long graft. So that's why I didn't address specifically this topic. Mariano, excellent talk. Uh, congratulations. Um, and uh, as you know, we all we are sharing the same opinion about uh, this uh, issue regarding the length of the nerve grafts. And uh, we also have a nice results, satisfactory results for our patients using long grafts, especially in the reconstructive surgery of the <coughs> total brachial plexus passive. We'll see five viable route uh, using even longer grafts in some cases, very, very satisfactory. So you will be satisfied, I believe, with uh, commentary which will appear in operative neurosurgery. Well, I didn't understand the, 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 the question. No, no, I'm, I'm just commented that, 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 ah. that this is a, this is a uh, quite a good uh, option for the patient, I, I would believe in this. Ah. Lesson. So this is my, and then we have, we are sharing the same experience and. Uh, thank you, thank you, Lucas. Yes, and, I agree. And, and, 
as I said, you will be, I believe, satisfied with the commentary, which will appear, I, I hope, uh, soon. Thank you. Uh, Christian, please. Mariano, it's a pleasure to have your talks. Uh, Thank you. Thank so you. What do you think is the main reason why long and short graphs work the same way? Do you believe uh, in vascular, you know, because you cut off the vas the sural or whatever nerve from any uh, vessel, so actually it's a, it's a dead piece of uh, tissue. So uh, the theory is that in, in the long grafts, uh, vascularization uh, has more difficulties to grow through, and other people say, and this is what most of this group believes, that, you know, either it works or it doesn't work. It's just one or nil and nothing in between. Do you think it's that easy? I, uh, you know, there are some theories for and against uh, this thing. In my, in my view, when you put a graft, you put a dead part of a conducting uh, of a cable. That's it. So uh, perhaps uh, nutrition is not so involved and that's why long graft uh, can really work. I don't know, but who knows? Uh, the, the, you know, uh, I'm going to quote. Uh, uh, I'm going to quote my friend and mentor Peter Richardson. In this. He he does a lot of work in the role of Schwann cells in central nervous system and peripheral nervous system regeneration when he was in Toronto. Um, and um, I, I think from one point of view, there's the axon tactic. Uh, properties of the Schwann cells themselves, and you need to keep them viable. And this gets viable within when the when, when the bed where you put the graft is good, well vascularized, and it's not extremely scarred. Then there is going to be better regeneration. And second issue is the you have to search for answers in the nerve cell itself. The the cell body is the one which which propose which which uh, propounds or which which uh, um, which accelerates the axonal growth and axonal sprouting and into the target muscle. So there is on one point the axonal tactic properties of the Schwann cell. The other side, there is the motor properties, motor in the sense of pushing the axonal growth properties of the nerve cell itself. So nourishment is important. Glial cells are important. Schwann cells are important. So when you're transplanting nerves, you're actually not transplanting nerves. You're transplanting Schwann cells. So you can all, for all you care, you can homogenize the nerve, crush it into little pieces and put it in the tube and put it in. You're still transplanting Schwann cells. You think so? No. You don't transplant the basal lamina? Oh yes, yes, indeed. Indeed, that is why, of course, it is a relative, I, I'm just taking it to extremes. Of course, the basal lamina to which the Schwann cells are adherent is the strut along which the axons grow. Uh, there's Michael, Michael Fox. Hi, Mariano, it was, it was a lovely talk. Uh, I'm always interested to know, to, uh, to, to think about the long graph, the long, long graphs and you know, why we get an outcome from them. I, I wonder, and I'm interested to hear your opinion. Um, I, I get concerned that we sometimes, I'm missing the subtleties of the outcome with my patients. So I sometimes worry that I don't have a good enough assessment for the outcomes because we look with sort of fairly blunt measures of, you know, M4, you know, or, you know, a, a single, you know, power outcome. And I don't, I worry that, we, you know, we see these patients, we follow them up, we see them once in three months, six months, and then maybe a year or two years. Uh, what do you think about fatigability of the muscle? You know, what are the, and real world use? we don't really have a good measure of that in our practice and i just wondered if you had in yours because i don't you know they go away and they come back to clinic and they show me they go yeah look i can do this and i worry that they go away put it in their pocket and only come and show me again in a year from now so what sort of measure do you you know i'd be interested to hear your view yeah you know this is very 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 interesting and uh, as you know uh, many of us are interested in brain plasticity so, for example, I'm going through these points, uh, Michael, that you uh, just talked about. Uh, if you use the phrenic nerve, for example, as donor, then the fatigue will come much easier, much um, faster than in, if you use the spinal accessory. Why? Because the spinal accessory is completely accustomed to, to, to fire all the time in order to keep the head ahead, right? 
but the, the, the phrenic nerve just fires when you inspirate, okay? So there is a complete difference in terms of brain using of those two donors. So brain fat fatigability is also uh, uh, influenced by these donors. So the same as I talk about good results using phrenic nerve, the fatigability is much easier and much faster using phrenic nerve. This was published also uh, last year uh, in, in, in ACTA by, by our group, uh, the, those two difference using different donors. And this fatigability is very important and is, all, uh, is underestimated as a record of our results. Uh, no, that's really helpful, uh, Mariano. Thank you very much. And and do you ha do you have any other measures of 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 you know of I mean obviously fatigability and and I mean just is there anything else that you measured any other questions do you use any other any other outcome measures for those patients you know because you've got such a big experience I just wondered. No, we use we use we abandoned the the British Medical Council as as you know you you you've been talking about that many times uh, and and uh, hear your talks and uh, uh, you know this is not a very good uh, scale in terms of results. So we I use agree, the, yeah. this index, yeah, this index comparing the healthy side in terms of having some idea of what kind of recovery did you obtain because a good result and let's say an M4 an old M4 can be. Uh, only 30% of a normal site, comparing the normal site and the affected site. So it never returns to normal, never, never, no no way. No, for sure. No, I appreciate there, that, Mariana, thank you. There's, thank you. if I may comment to that question as well, this is, um, in, in, this, in this study, they studied the length of the graft versus recovery of a target muscle. So it is, it is not about the usefulness of the arm or usefulness, how the patient is able to uh, recruit the re reanimated function uh, into his everyday life, uh, rather just whether the long graft helps or the short graft, is what is better? Is it, uh, so it's pretty straightforward. Of course, nothing is so straightforward in brachial plexus surgery. That's, I mentioned before that the cohort studies, they have their limitations in application. I mean, they, you, you, it, it does not reflect a real life scenario, not necessarily. So individual cases are much more didactic and, and brings us much more experience and exposure than uh, cohort studies. Unless otherwise it's about something. Yeah, um, Christian, please. So in, I absolutely agree with the lacking assessment of, of the outcomes. And you know, having this, uh, uh, that was somebody calling the, the Christmas tree effect that you, you know, you wave once your hand and that's it. And the rest for the, of the year, it's like Michael said. So Linda Young from, uh, from, from the US, they started a project as, this is maybe one year ago that they uh, used, make use of the, the smart watches to, you know, to really assess if the patients at home use their hands or their, their limbs, whatever limb is affected, and then collect the data from, from this one because you know they, they will give the patients these smart watches, so everybody loves it and wants to wear it, of course. So this is a, you know, this is a, I think a very brilliant way to to have some kind of assessment of, of real daily life movement and not just the doctor's effect once a year. Yeah. Let me to put a comment on, on that, uh, and I absolutely do agree because we uh, make videos of our patients moving and waving their limbs and all that. But when you ask, this is my personal experience, of course, when you ask the patient, how do you use your arm uh, in a daily life? Well, they use it much less than what we think. Mukund, please. A quick comment about the blood supply in long graphs. So nerves are supplied by an axial vessel and segmental vessels. And it is my belief that if the bed is good, multiple segmental vessels develop along the course of a long graft, which is what really keeps it alive because there is no axial vessel which will go for 20 centimeters and perfuse that graft. And on that note, I want to request all of you to excuse me. My son is catching a flight for Germany as we speak. So I need to say goodbye to him. Thank you very much for it. Thank you, thank you very, very much, Paul. One question for all of us. Uh, let us uh, talk a little bit about uh, long uh, grafts in, uh, for example, uh, 
long lesions in continuity in cases uh, similar like uh, Michael presenting his uh, serious uh, like uh, long radial nerve lesion, for example, in continuity, and you have to make a reconstruction to resect this lesion. Would you use a long grafts? And how long you would use? In early or late stage? And do, would you, should we use some additional procedures in these cases? I, I'm, I, I can come in on that and say I think it depends, Lucas. For me, it depends when the when the the timing of the identification of the lesion is important, because um, you want to. And for me, it also depends on the location of the lesion within the nerve and the t the distance to the target organ. The radial nerve tends to be injured the mid substance or quite close to the muscle bulk, so. In those circumstances, I'd have a lower threshold for putting in a, a longer graft later, but obviously the more proximal the lesion, um, I would be uh, more reluctant to do so, maybe thinking more about a nerve transfer uh, or a combination. In the same stage or in a, several stages? At the same stage, when you explore the, for example, seven, seven months old or eight months old uh, lesion of the radial nerve, and you have two lesion uh, 12 centimeter long, would you use long grafts or, or not? And would you use some additional procedures at the same stage or not? What he means is secondary reconstructive procedures such as tendon yeah. transfers. For, for example. Right away. For yeah. example. Oh, sorry, do you, you mean tendon transfers as well? Or, or you, yeah. mean, you meant it? I think, I think simultaneously. Yeah, I, I, I take your point. Um, uh, I don't know, people, you know, people have published quite extensively on uh, you know, considering even just a wrist transfer, um, you know, as part of the rehabilitation, and supposedly the outcome is better if you, you know, if you graft and do a wrist um, extensor transfer. But um, I, I, for me, um, the tendon transfers, as long as you have uh, appropriate and good uh, hand therapy, I think um, you can do that all later. You've got to you give a commitment to your initial nerve surgery, be that a nerve transfer or a, or a nerve graft repair. I, I think there are, it depends on the individual patient, how reliable they are. And I think that's very much a case by case and, and surgeon by surgeon. I'm sure we'll have five different answers from this panel. Uh, I, would, I would certainly like to uh, know the opinions of uh, Dimitri, if I may translate it. Dimitri, are you there? Dimitri, where is Yes, yes, yes. Uh, Dr. Uh, Professor Razulic говорил, что представьте, что у вас поражение радиального нерва в продлительности 12 сантиметров и 8 месяцев от времени поражения. Вы будете ли делать пересадки, перенаправление сухожилия в то же время, когда вы будете нерв реконструировать? I just ask to repeat your question in Russian, Luka. Да, 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 конечно. Я, я буду делать обязательно тендон трансфер, а по поводу восстановления нерва, ну, мы еще подумаем. Вот так вот. Нет, нет, вопрос о том, чтобы вы, вы будете нервы реконструировать. Ну, вы делаете ли в тот же время еще? Да, да. So, да. Uh, Dimitri answers that he would certainly prefer to do the tendon transfer in the same stage uh, when he does the nerve reconstruction if the nerve, uh, if the nerve lesioning has, uh, had, had happened eight months ago and the length of the lesion is about 12 centimeters, the scenario of what uh, Lucas had actually projected to the panel at the moment. Well, I'm preparing one series, one paper with a quite number of patients with this situation. So I will not talk now, but generally speaking, uh, Somehow we, we prefer to do in these cases uh, all, all, all these procedures at the same time. You understand me? Like augmentation of, of all uh, augmentation of functional recovery, general functional recovery. Uh, I, I, I personally don't. I personally will not, especially when it concerns the radial nerve. I will give the nerve a chance, even if it is eight months. Unless otherwise, the patient is 80 plus and we don't have much time. In, in, in cases with nine, nine months after the injury, for example, late admission of the patient, uh, 12 centimeters of the, of the 
uh, nerve defect uh, after the lesion in continuity, which is unuseful, I mean, non-functional. Would you resect the lesion and put uh, long grafts only? Or would you do, would you escape from this and do only nerve transfer? Or would you perform to do some distal transfers? Or would you perform to, to do all things? Lynn, uh, please, before you go, we can take one screenshot all together. Uh, and we'll do it, I think, and, and is following us just to show, to take a screenshot of for all panels. You want, I, I mean, yes, of course. I'm, not so, I'm not so clear with the question, but this is my, this was my question. So, uh, and please take one screenshot uh, and of course. here and the camera is on. Absolutely. One, two, and three. Great. Thank you. Thank you. It was a pleasure, Lynn. Put on the microphone, Lynn, please. Oh, yeah, Lynn yeah. is gone. Yeah. Lynn, right. yeah. so, Thank you so me, much. Yeah. Thank you, Lynn. Thank you very much. Uh, Mariano wanted to answer that question. I, no, no, I just wanted to say that uh, as, as, you, as you saw, I speak very well about long graft and all that, uh, very well in, in terms of uh, good results. I mean, but please, uh, this is a very uh, specific situation. You have a complete brachial plexus injury. You are using as donor a complete normal nerve, which can be the phrenic or the spinal accessory, and you use a, a, a long graft. But it is completely different when, for example, you have a long uh, a primary injury of the sciatic nerve, where you have to use a lot of lo long grafts. So this is completely different. And I want to clarify this because uh, we, can, we cannot uh, uh, say that always long grafts are better than short grafts, right? I'm just speaking about this specific, very specific situation, just to clarify that. Talk about heterogeneity of lesions. All right. So, um, Lucas and Mariano, both representatives of ENS and WFNS, um, I would like to ask you to give your final remarks. I think we had a fantastic session today. And I thank all the speakers for adhering to the program and presenting. Uh, very stimulating cases from which we learned a lot today, I think. So, um, Lucas and Mariano, please bring forth your thoughts and we can adjourn for the day. I, I just want to thank uh, everyone to, to, to this. Well, like, keep on, like, keep on rolling, like, keep on rolling. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. So, uh, it was a real pleasure and honor and to spend this two hours in a uh, highly effective and um, I believe highly stimulating uh, webinar related to the peripheral nerve surgery with uh, interesting cases, uh, international appraisal. And um, I believe, do believe that this is, uh, has some significant impact factor to the participants, young generations, and they will, uh, increase the interest uh, for peripheral neurosurgery. So this is some of our tasks that we take took a long time ago to uh, promote our, our field. And uh, nice number of participants is a, a nice parameter for, for this. Uh, uh, we can be very satisfied with this initiative. This is a first international collaboration uh, and multidisciplinary co collaboration between all uh, nerve, nerve specialists, neurosurgeons who are doing uh, neurosurgery multidisciplinary. Uh, again, this is a joint venture with um, uh, WFNS, Committee for Peripheral Neurosurgery, and the ENS section for Peripheral Neurosurgery, which uh, we consider very important. And uh, we heard. Uh, experience from all five continents in uh, solving this uh, difficult and controversial cases of peripheral surgery. I would like to thank all of you, my friends, first of all, panelists, and um, last but not least, participants, of course, 
and last but not least, uh, ENS uh, for this continued support. We I will use this opportunity to announce our next webinar, which will be in around uh, about two months uh, or maybe six weeks uh, uh, regarding uh, food drop treatment. And uh, I'm using this opportunity to invite you all in this webinar, although this will be announced and distributed uh, through the ENS and all other our channels. So thank you very much once again. Uh, enjoy the evening and uh, Mariano, keep on rolling. Keep on rolling. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Bye -bye, guys. Thank you very much. Congratulations, Katrin, for the organization and idea. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's uh, without your support, I couldn't have done it. Uh -huh. And I did. I did very less here. I did very less here. I just put the program together and, and let others talk. More, think, or less, uh, more or less, this is it. I have to. I have to let others talk. I think because you give me the microphone. Yeah, that is. Uh, keep on talking. <laughs> I have a bad yeah. habit of doing that. Together we are stronger. Working together. Yeah. Further together. Okay. All the best. Thanks, guys. Michael. Bye -bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Goodbye. Bye-bye. Thank you.